Okay, so that is uh, essentially what I'm getting at is integrability and experiment. Thank you, Pascal. And thank you for the invitation. Um, I'll be talking about experiments done at Penn State. Uh, the uh, experiments were all done by Yuan Li, Neil Malvania, and Josh Wilson for the earlier ones, and in collaboration with the theory group of Marcus Rigal, Yi Cheng Zhang, and uh, Jerome Dubai as the next speaker. So the, uh, you know, it's generally known that many body quantum systems are hard to calculate, and then generalized high dynamics gives a, uh, a way to calculate things that are previously uncalculable. And it applies to nearly integrable systems. And I want to touch a little bit upon what, at least from a practical perspective, is a nearly integrable system. And uh, before this work, it had not been tested in, in experiments that, when I say real experiments, experiments that are not just like things you think up, but things you can actually do in the lab. So I'll start off with a little bit of a reminder of the Lieblinger model and uh, rapidities and generalized high dynamics background. And then I'll show how we measure momentum, dynamical firm, how we observe dynamical fermization and therefore how we measure rapidities. And then I'll show you our experimental tests of GHD. So if you have a, uh, the Wendy Bose gas with delta-like interactions, that's the Lieblinger model. And it's an interval model. It allows for beta onset solutions, which were they're all parameterized with this parameter gamma, a dimensionless coupling strength. Depends on the density, depends upon the strength of this uh, 1D interaction. It's an interval model. And uh, which means as, a, as a, uh, a consequence that there's many extra conserved quantities. And those conserved quantities are the distribution of rapidities. It also means because it's integral that you can calculate all the local properties and the wave functions exactly. And uh, the background, at least as far as it relates to experiments, is that Maxime Malshani showed uh, quite some time ago now that uh, you can, if you put an atom in a waveguide kind of trap, it approximates the Lieblinger model uh, very well if it's in the, in the transverse ground state. So the, those solutions as a function of gamma, uh, you can generally understand in, uh, in a few regimes, the gamma is much greater than one, it's called the tongue gas. And that's where the uh, kinetic energy associated with uh, strong correlations among the particles. This cartoon picture basically shows that uh, although you might find a particle anywhere, you're never going to find two particles in the same place if you're far in the Tungstrad regime. Uh, and then in the other limit where gamma is much greater than one, the uh, mean field energy dominates. And uh, so you don't have the same kind of particle particle correlations. Uh, Fermionization is what happens in this Tungstrad limit where uh, the many-body wave function of the bosons looks like many-body wave functions of non-interactive fermions. So there have been many experiments done with 1D gases that dealt, illustrate a lot of properties and equilibrium of these gases. But because they're experiments, they have to be done in traps. I mean, so their actual experiment needs to be in a trap in general, at least it needs to start off in a trap. And, uh, but as soon as you add the trap term, it breaks the integrability. The way the theory is solved for this, I think the first example of it was uh, uh, Alshani writing a paper sort of motivated by what I told him we could do in, uh, in these experiments, uh, is just using the local density approximation where you say, okay, the density varies within each small unit, we can assign a given alpha because there's a given density there and you can make a solution. And, uh, and it works really very well. And, and part of the reason is that adding this trap lifts the integrability only to a very slight degree. So what do I mean by a slight degree? Well, the uh, you know, maybe most general definition of integrability, which is also touched on yesterday, is that you don't have any three-body diffractive collisions. That is where three momenta come in and three different momenta go out of some collision. If you have an integral system, you don't have any higher body collisions. And I just note that in, in 1D, you're given the, the fact that there's no diffractive two-body collisions for free because it's, you can't conserve energy momentum in a diffractive two-body collision in 1D. So when I say nearly integrable, I really mean that the rate of these three-body diffractive collisions is small compared to whatever dynamics you're looking at. Uh, okay. So, and you, know, you could sort of see why that is true when you put on a weak trap and it's been calculated uh, in more detail, which is that when you have these particles in a, in a pretty shallow axial trap, locally, there's no way for the particles, any particles that are colliding three at a time to, uh, to know that there's a trap. Uh, 
you know, there's no like curvature underneath them, which is significant, which is why the integrability is very lifted. So in experiments like the quantum Newton's cradle, which I won't describe, but basically you have atoms extremely out of uh, equilibrium, it doesn't thermalize for a very long time. And it doesn't thermalize for a very long time because the system is nearly integral, right? The rate of these diff diffractive three-body collisions is at least very small. Okay, so now that gets us to the distribution of rapidities, which is what we're gonna be following when we're, when we're looking at generalized hydrodynamics. So the first definition is those set of conserved quantities that emerge in the integral system. And a second definition is uh, it's the momentum distribution of the quasi particles that arise in the system, right? Which is just to say, uh, if we had this cartoon picture of the correlations for single particle wave functions in space, but when you do the beta onslaught solution, you in rapidity space and quasi particle momentum space, you find that the solution for each of these things is a set of uh, in the in the the uh, Tangshiro limit. It looks like free fermions, just a discrete set of momentum, maybe some broadening from associated with uh, with a, it being a very large size. Uh, but no matter what this looks like here, no matter what the correlations are among the particles, the beta onslaught solutions give you something which looks like uh, a bunch of discrete uh, or a, a, bunch, a range of quasi-particle momentum. And in fact, a lot of the work in the uh, solution uh, to the Lieb linear model has to do with exactly working out with, with the spacing among these various momenta are. So if you have a homogeneous space, a homogeneous system, then these two different definitions are exactly the same, right? Because, you know, it's really the first thing was that you had the set of conserved quantities, and then you can look at it and you say, okay, those conserved quantities look like momenta of some sort of particle. So those are the quasi particles and they have these momenta. But if you have a trap, then these definitions are obviously not equivalent because the quasi-particle momenta aren't conserved. There's a force exerted by the trap on those momenta, and uh, and uh, you know they are just generally not conserved. So if uh, you have something which is a nearly integral system, which is that you don't have those diffractive three-body collisions, then the quasi-particles themselves don't decay, right? Which is to say that even though their momenta are not conserved, the quasi-particles are still something which sort of have a, a continuous life through the whole thing. And it's, it's that feature that is really the, the core of why uh, you can uh, use general, generalized hydrodynamics to study these nearly renewable systems. So I'm not gonna go through, you know, interest of time and interest of the fact that there are more expert people than me in the audience to explain generalized hydrodynamics in detail, but um, it's, a set of coupled equations uh, which uh, look at the flow of, uh, of uh, density through the system while keeping track of all the individual rapidities, you know, some discretized rapidities in this distribution through space. So it's just like regular hydrodynamics, but now instead of just momentum, say, being conserved, it's all this entire, uh, you know, this uh, rapidity distribution locally is conserved. And, uh, you know, the trick associated with this particle, quasi-particle group velocity, which is a well-defined thing as long as the local generalized Gibbs ensemble is satisfied at each point throughout the dynamics. So there's essentially two assumptions in here. You know, it's not a strictly uh, correct description, it's an approximation. One is that you can apply a continuum description, which is not surprising that you could for real systems because that's not so different from the uh, local density approximation. And the second thing is that uh, you have this local equilibration is equilibration to the local generalized Gibbs ensemble at every within every cell. Okay, so GHD has been uh, experimentally, uh, you know, the first uh, test of it was in the high temperature uh, weak coupling limit in uh, the group of Isabel Bouchel, and it shows it agrees extremely well. And what we're doing is we're testing GHD near zero temperature with a uh, both intermediate coupling strength and strong coupling strength, and we put on very large quenches. So, but in order to, you know, the thing which is sort of taken care of in general hydrodynamics is these uh, theta, which are the rapidities. So we are going to follow the rapidities in the experiment. And rapidities is something which for a long time seemed like they would just be a bookkeeping technique, but the fact is you can actually measure them. Uh, and to see how, and it's sort of, gradually observed to great and greater depth over time, uh, theoretically, if you start off with 
bosons that are trapped and then release them in a flat potential, then as they expand, all their interaction energies and all the kinetic energy associated with them avoiding each other, all that stuff goes to zero relative to the sort of center mass motion of all these particles. And therefore the quasi particles become just essentially the bare particles, which means that if you measure the momentum of the particles at the end of this expansion, what you're measuring is the rapidity distribution, right? Because the, uh, the rapidity distribution from the whole time hasn't changed. It's just at the end, it's the momentum distribution of the particles. So as an example of how that works, this was uh, shown uh, by um, Marcos Rigol when he was a graduate student, where you look at the, um, the time oil gas has this momentum distribution, which is extremely peaked up. And then a non-interacting Fermi gas in the same trap has this sort of fermionic uh, flatter top distribution. And if you just do this thing, you release that those atoms and allow them to expand in 1D, but in, in uh, uh, flat potential, the momentum distribution of the atoms becomes the, um, the rapidity distribution, right? So then at the end, if you can measure this thing at the end, you're measuring the rapidity distribution. So if it's a tungsten oil gas, that's dynamical fermionization. That's where you get this, this uh, fermionization of the momentum distribution in this dynamical process. But in general, this is always true for any gamma that you're going to get not the momentum distribution of fermions, but the actual rapidity distribution for whatever that gas was. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to think about this process because what you're saying is that as you do this expansion, the actual nature of the quasi particles is changing at every step until they become like the bare particles. But throughout the whole time, their momenta is the thing which is unchanging. So, that uh, gets us to our experiment, and uh, we start off with a uh, bundle of tubes, and uh, it's actually the tubes, there's like a million of them, but we only populate the middle 10,000 or 1,000 tubes. There's 25 atoms, uh, either, you know, range of 0 to 25 or 0 to 140, and, um, and the atoms are free to move in along the tubes, except for we add another trap that we can independently uh, turn on and off. So it's one dimension because all the energies in the problem are less than the vibrational spacing in the transverse direction, and there's negligible tunneling between uh, tubes. So we want to be able to measure both the momentum and the uh, and the uh, rapidities. So the momentum distribution I'll describe on the next slide to measure the rapidities, which is in the time short element, just like dynamical fermionization. We first just prepare the atoms in the lattice. And then we turn off this axial trap and let the atom expand, atoms expand while they're still in 1D for some time, which is variable. And then after that variable time, we measure the momentum distribution. So if the time is long, then that's the rapidity distribution. If the time is short, then that's the actual initial momentum distribution. So to do the momentum measurement, these are just a picture of just a few of these uh, million tubes. Uh, there's tightly confined, and then we rapidly turn them off, which means that the atoms from the tube just expand ballistically transversely. And uh, the interaction energy rapidly drops to much lower than it was to begin with. So therefore, from that point on, the momentum distribution in one dimension stops evolving. So uh, what this measurement looks like is here. So we've the, the tubes would be oriented vertical in the picture at, at uh, when we're going to do the momentum measurement, we turn off the uh, those traps. They go atoms go flying transversely, and then we look at the time of flight in the vertical direction. All right. So then all the images that you'll see will be we integrate in this transverse direction, and then we plot up what it looks like in the vertical direction. So this is what what it looks like when you're looking at the initial momentum distribution at evolution of zero, and then if we allow it to evolve for 15 milliseconds, uh, it looks different. And that's because these atoms over that time have evolved uh, due to these interactions with 1D. So this is what those experimental results look like as a function of time from 0, 1, 3, 6, 9, et cetera. And you see it asymptotes the distribution. And then this is the theory that was done using, assuming the time shadow limit, but without any other free parameters, accounting for everything about these, this bundle of tubes. And you see the agreement is extremely good, especially at the long time when you actually get this uh, fermionic distribution. So that's this measurement of dynamical fermionization, and it shows that we can measure the distribution of rapidities. 
okay, so we can measure the distribution of parities, but then what are we going to do? We have to take the system out of equilibrium. And the way we do that is uh, by doing some kind of, of uh, quench of the trap. And it was shown in 2005 that if you quench from a deep trap to a shallow trap, you start off with a with a uh, bosonic distribution, and then it evolves into a fermionic distribution, and then it evolves back into a boson distribution of a narrower or narrower width. And uh, so this Bose-fermionic oscillations has been predicted for a long time. Uh, I just note that if you do the opposite, which is what we actually do in the experiment, mostly which is starting from a shallow trap and go to a deeper trap, it's the same thing. It's a Bose to fermion to Bose of a different width distribution. So we did that experiment with uh, in the range of starting with a gamma of eight, evolving to a gamma of two, the experimental uh, widths of the momentum distribution are in, shown in blue. You show have this uh, double period thing because the uh, the distribution changes very much when you're at the point of say peak compression there. If you so so that, that's the this is the experiment in blue. The theory is in red. The you know, theory is Tom Shirogas theory doesn't exactly apply to this experiment. But if you just rescale the widths and the shapes, you uh, widths and the height, so you can compare the shapes. You see that the shapes are basically the same in the experiment as in theory, uh, which is to say they go from bosonic to fermionic to bosonic to fermionic. You know, these are all the bosonic distributions, the fermionic distributions. Okay, so um, qualitatively the same, you know, something about the fact that all those beta onzot solutions, whatever the actual nature of the quasi-particles are, are pretty similar looking. And, uh, but, uh, but it's not a quantitative thing. But if you want to do a quantitative thing, you've got to think about rapidities, you've got to use GHD. So we did that in similar conditions, starting off with lower gamma, we did a 10 times quench to a 10 times deeper trap. And what you're seeing in red is the evolution of the distribution of rapidities as a function of time through the first two cycles. And the blue is generalized hydrodynamic theory, which agrees very well. Okay. And, uh, I note that it's interesting that even though there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on with the momentum distribution, bosonic, fermionic, changing all the time, the actual distribution of rapidities is self-similar over these first two cycles. They are just the same as a function of time, but the, uh, the theory gives you what the uh, width is. Okay, so quantum quantitatively produces these distributions. But that doesn't exactly test the theory as much as you might. So what we also did is 100 times quench starting off from a reasonably high gamma. And these are the experimental distribution of rapidity. Uh, maybe it's two minutes to 20. Okay, I'll, I'll probably be about four or five. Um, and, uh, and you see it, it uh, evolves like that. And if you look at the generalized hydrodynamics theory, it's in blue and you know, it just looks like a different color because it agrees incredibly well, right? This is a situation where the number of atoms per tube on average is only 11. So this idea about you know, the concern that can you apply uh, the GHD in the situation with so few particles is actually, apparently you can, even the continuum approximation works even for such a small number of particles. And if you look at the distribute, the rescale distributions in this case, it looks pretty self-similar for the first one. And then you're starting to get a deviation already in the second cycle. So there's, you know, there's something else going on in more detail for what those shapes are. Uh, it's a big quench. We start off with 17 micron uh, length of atoms and then uh, they compress down to about a half a micron. So you really, really uh, slam the atoms together, but the theory still agrees well. You know, this is what the shape of the distribution looks like. And we don't get that experimentally, we get that just in theory. And you see that, uh, the, you know, I, I use this to point out the fact that there are some sharp features in a single tube that you miss, and you also miss some sharp features in, in the uh, rapidity distribution, but you do get about the same size. And anyway, we model all the different tubes and, and we can therefore compare directly to the theory. We can measure the energy as a function of time by looking, integrating the energy in those rapidity distributions. And this is a comparison to the blue points in theory, also worked very well. Uh, we can do the same thing, but measure the kinetic energy, which is what we get when we do the energy from the momentum distribution. And you see, uh, although you can't measure the momentum, you can't calculate the momentum distributions in these places, you can use GHD to infer what the kinetic energy is as a function of time. And, uh, and you see it agrees, except for right in the highest density points where the momentum measurement fails. 
And, and then if you look at the difference between those th two things, that gives you the interaction energy as a function of time, which if it wasn't for changing densities and other details, it would just look like that. So uh, what this is showing is that we're going from a very high gamma where there, there's uh, not a, a lot of uh, mean field energy and we're going to something which is very low gamma where the nature of the quasi particles are totally different. And because it agrees so well, then you say GHD is working. So it puts this other approximation to the test. So this was the uh, experiment, the comparison for the first uh, two cycles. Six cycles in, you're starting to see those deviations in the shape more dramatically and the theories and the experiments still uh, agree pretty well with each other. There's a certain imperfections in the experiment associated with uh, how well centered we are in the trap, which are, we are pretty well centered, but, but uh, those slight side-to-side uh, -side imperfections are imperfections. But you see, you know, even these pretty funky shaped features are captured in the theory. By the time we get to the 11th or 21st cycles, you're starting to see uh, features that appear in the theory that we don't see in the experiment, which is probably that the experimental perfections are smearing them out. Although, again, you don't really know that it's not uh, GHD approximations uh, starting to run out. But if you look at it later times, like the uh, these, this is first, second, sixth, 11th, 21st cycle, and look at the energy as a function of time, that agrees well with the theory. This extensive quantity doesn't care so much about that averaging, and, uh, and it continues to work really pretty far after that quench. So in summary, we've observed dynamic formization and shown that we can measure rapidity distributions. Uh, we've uh, therefore been able to use that to test GHD and we've tested both uh, of the assumptions that go into it pretty well for this class of experiment with very large quenches. In the future, there's other things we can do to add uh, potentials and break energy building and uh, have slightly uh, differently non-integrable systems. And we can also, attempt, and this is the next thing we do, is to show how we can, uh, for at least a short time, have the GGE not apply and therefore have GHD not apply. So uh, integrable systems is a theoretical construct, but nearly integral systems is an experimental practical thing. And, um, and there are also more generic systems. And it, the fact that GHD works so well in this regime of near integrable just, you know, it seems conceivable that it might be possible to ultimately adapt the system, adapt the theory to uh, deal with ever, ever more uh, generic situations. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, David. So questions online, oh, there are already, there is one and Benjamin, please go on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this very nice talk. So I was wondering, uh, did you try to uh, consider, um, well, I mean, there are many corrections to GHG that, that may or may not explain the, the, you know, the discrepancy you find at, at large number of cycles. You tried to consider diffusive corrections, which are known, or I think uh, how strong they would be. Or... So uh, I, I'm reasonably confident that, uh, that the problem that you know when when we start to compare the the uh, theory that far in, it's just any little any little imperfections in the uh, in the uh, trap, which has yeah. little imperfections, mm -hmm. could accumulate over that time enough uh, distance f from what you, what the model is that you know whatever we do there, I don't think it's possible to use that as an actual test of anything. Okay. Right. Yeah. So uh, I think to, in order to test the fuses corrections, what you would want to do is something which works in the first couple of cycles and has a big effect so that then you could immediately see what, what happens. So, I mean, I think over time, it's something that uh, with um, that with Jerome, you know, we might uh, pursue. I don't think we have exactly what the form of such an experiment is, but I think you'd have to look at it directly. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem. Anything which is very far out is just very vulnerable to little imperfections. And maybe then to, to push on that, uh, would you be able to uh, set up the experiment so that you have strong enough variations, like on short enough scales? Yes. So that you can access then diffusive corrections kind of precisely? We can, yeah. Because, I mean, the, the short, the way that we do it, um, that we're doing it now, in fact, for this, this idea of um, watching the local approach to, to the GGE is with a, um, a wave function quench. 
like yeah. for a very short time putting on a a, 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 a lattice like potential which varies very rapidly because if, as long as you can have good enough temporal resolution which i think we do for that uh that immediately puts the system in, in a totally locally non-equilibrium system and then you have to wait for some uh some local relaxation before yeah. before any theory actually describes it well but then you know maybe maybe that's the you know we i think we can break ghd and yeah. the question is we can break it and therefore if there are corrections to ghd in that short time we can test them yeah yes. thanks more questions in ktp yes uh, one question david very nice talk i have a very nice question. So before, when you are in the strongly interacting limit, uh, then we can use naive fermionization and do the dynamics, including the, the trap exactly, because it's just, we know the eigenstate of, of fermions in, in a trap. So is there anything that you can compare, for example, in the strong interacting limit, the breakdown of really the homogeneous approximation by comparing just standard fermionization that might work for a, store, a strong gamma or large gamma compared to the hydro, uh, hydrodynamic approach? So, so we do, uh, you know, it's one, one of the uh, things that Marcus has done for a long time, which is uh, running dynamical simulations in that Tangshudo limit. And, and you see, you know, for this dynamical uh, fermionization, it works pretty quantitatively well because we're starting off with a pretty high uh, gamma and then it only gets larger over time as the thing expands. It's just that for uh, otherwise, we are limited about to the range of a gamma of 10 and a gamma of 10 is, is sufficiently high that even when you're, when you're doing these, uh, you know, the, when you're doing the kind of things that we're doing in the trap, it's not enough like a, um, like a uh, tonsured gas to actually quantitatively give you the right answer. So, so the corrections for large gamma are larger than the corrections from the trap. That, that's, that's the uh, Yeah, I think the correct, I mean, the correction for the trap is something that's got to be part of your model anyway. But uh, certainly, if, it, if you mean like the non-integrability associated with the trap, it's very small. Very small. Right, it, it's, uh, yeah, and it's mostly that, uh, the, the reason, I mean, we can do, in fact, I, I haven't, didn't show it here, but uh, the, uh, the theory part of our collaboration did calculations of GHD in the, uh, in the large gamma limit compared to these exact calculations of large gamma limit. And we definitely learned a lot of things about, uh, about um, you know, th that gave us a lot of confidence that you'd expect GHD to actually work in, uh, in this very low number regime but uh yeah I'm, I'm trying to think of what i think you you couldn't if there's some small change and you're trying to do this sort of level of exact comparison of theory to experiment there's nothing in the high gamma limit that other than i think what we've already done which uh, lends itself to that you know, it's, it's just uh yeah i mean if, if you look at most parameters as a function of gamma, before you, you know you're still getting about like eighty or ninety percent of the the final uh, infinite gamma limit at around gamma equals ten. Okay. So that's a pretty pretty far off in terms of uh, what the wave functions look like. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Is there any other question comment? Yeah, one more question. Uh, hi, Dave. Uh, so I'm wondering about the long time after losses play a role. I, there's a recent paper that basically made the point, and I forget who it's by, but uh, it made the point that if you have a set of uh, decay events that are slow compared to the GGE or the GHD equilibration time, then you can basically, even as you lose particles from the trap, it's still locally at every time in and sort of GG equilibrium uh, or the GHD equilibrium. Could you probe this even after you have lots of particle loss? Have you seen this? Have you... Um, I, I think that we probably could, uh, although we haven't uh, included particle loss in the theory. And the particle loss is already a little bit complicated because you have to know exactly where the particles are lost. So, I mean, it, it's pretty demanding on your modeling of the whole system. 
but but just qualitatively that speaks to me as what's going to happen that is if you have just loss from any mechanism then uh that's like locally taking away some some particles and and uh to within some sort of equilibration time it will then uh uh you know, just, you know, it's, it's not like breaking into a building the other way, which would be to have diffractive free body collisions because the diffractive free body collisions really rearranges the, uh, rapidity distribution in, in a way which, uh, which, you know, is like thermalization. Whereas just loss is more like a little local perturbation, which doesn't change the rapidity. I mean, changes the rapidity distribution, but just up by a little, you know, small bit around some point where it is. So yeah, if there was a, clear theory for it, we could measure this through loss, right? We could also probably drive loss and then, you know, see the healing associated with loss. But yeah, the last time I've looked, there wasn't a clear enough theory to do it. So I should uh, look again, or if you can give me the reference, that would be good. Great. Thanks, Dave. Sure, Kaden. Okay. I think now time is gone. I had also curiosity, but I will leave for another occasion.